Okay, just to kick off, I, b- I believe you were uh, something of a late starter in terms of uh, performing your own songs. Yeah, I was actually um, uh, a guitar player before I was anything. I mean, in, in in school, everyone told me I had a terrible voice, so I never sang. So in the rock bands, I, I mean, my idea was just to be, I wanted to be Keith Richards rather than Mick Jagger. Hmm. So, uh, and it wasn't until... God, my third year in college, where uh, I went uh, to Spain, one of those year abroad programs. Do you guys have that? Uh, yes, yes. I went to Spain, and, and I had written these songs, that, but I just kept them kind of as a, a diary for myself, and I was ashamed to play them for anyone, plus I didn't think I could sing. But here in Spain, a friend and I said, for fun, we had a couple beers, and let's busk on the street. And so she brought her flute. We must have been awful. Flute and guitar. <laughs> And I played my songs for the first time and sang, and um, you know, because I figured I'd never see these people again, and they don't know what I'm singing anyway. What do I have to lose? And I'm a little drunk, and uh, and a guy came by and and asked us to play his bar, and so then two months later, I dropped out of school and was still playing this guy's bar, singing my own songs. Before all that happened, was there any other career path you'd mapped out for yourself besides music? confused college kid. I was an international mm. affairs major. No, it was very political, actually. Mm. I was a, a, on campus. I was the one that did, like, you know, Coors Beer. I did a boycott of Coors Beer because they, they kind of had some subtle racist policies. And I, I thought somehow I was going to be involved in, in politics. So, and, and music is a hobby. And I think if that guy hadn't walked by, I wonder... Um, you know what would have happened would be, yeah yeah well you might mo- i would have been a mom selling real estate maybe <laughs> i don't know <laughs> were you much of a music fan growing up was it a big deal for you oh uh well, yeah i had i had uh i had i still have a brother who's six years older than me who had the kind of local band in town he was the guitar player and my parents were um the nice liberal parents who let uh, the band practice in the basement every day after school so it was always there my brother had really tons of records and really good taste at that time so um you know you know i, w- I was ahead of my peers mm-hmm. were, you know more into kind of more teeny bopperish stuff so you know I, I i got a wide variety from from you know my brother would have like bowie records but then have uh you know, some weird blue, you know, the Velvet Underground, but then have but Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell or John Prine, so. so how did that uh, the first recording deal with MCA come about? Uh, that was another kind of chance luck thing. I, I, I'm from Colorado, and I, I was planning on moving. I had a band in Denver, and we were local celebs as far as Denver goes. And... Um, we, I decided I'm going to move to New York City. I'm going to hit the big time. And so I had a show, my, my goodbye to New York, to uh, Denver show, and there happened to be a guy in the audience, actually from Nashville, of all places, that had a publishing company with, uh, had, uh, that was linked with Warner Brothers. And uh, that's how it started. He was interested in me, and I actually moved to New York, but actually my connection was in Nashville, and he, um, I did a show there, and there were... A and R people from uh, New York actually coming to see me in Nashville, so it's was, it was kind of com- confusing. But uh, again, another case of someone just happening hap- happening to be there, and he he didn't hear about me. He just was walking the streets and saw there was music. Hmm. Now they matched you up with Todd Rungren as your uh, first producer. I believe it wasn't a terribly comfortable situation for you. For a couple of reasons. One is, uh, you know, he, he was a semi-icon, and, and, you know, I'd never met any famous artist. And, mm. and I, 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 there was a part of me that was a fan. And, and uh, also, he, he's a odd character. He's not, he doesn't have the best bedside manners. Now, I really like him. He's a good guy. I, can, I, I, I really like him. But for the first time ever going into a studio... He, he was kind of harsh. He, 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 for instance, I would be singing a, a song 
petrified, you know, uh, of his judgment. You know, mostly my own problem, but he'd go, uh, all right, that's adequate. Let's move on to the next song. Mm. <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, God. And, and his girlfriend, who was his wife now, would say, uh, you know, but you've got to understand, for Todd, adequate means really good, but, you know. <laughs> For me, I, I was, it was really, I, I had a hard time, but uh, then after that, you know, I, I was probably, uh, you know, a little toughened, I guess. Right. You felt intimidated first up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Completely intimidated. Well, yeah, I, I, I had never been in a recording studio before. Yeah. Not even on a four-track cassette player. Very daunting. It was completely, and here's a funny story is Todd, when I first got there, he said, oh, you know what, we're going to stop in a day for two days because I'm having my annual Labor Day uh, party. And so he had like 50 to 100 of his friends coming from all over the globe, coming to his house to watch, I don't know if you guys know the Jerry Lewis telethon. Uh, we know of it, yep. Yeah, it's just really kitschy. Labor Day, you know, September 1st uh, event. It's just really Vegasy and kitschy. And so he, he gets like three big screen TVs, uh, has them and his friends, and then he had it like a table full of psychedelic mushrooms. <laughs> and and uh, so here, before we even began, you know, there's like a hundred people tripping at the studio. <laughs> I mean, that was kind of, now I look back and that was really fun, you know, but my God, that was how it started. A little daunting. Yeah, for sure. Now, apparently there was another MCA album you did that never saw the light of day. Will that ever surface? Probably not. Is uh, That was an interesting one too because then from Todd Rundgren to going and working with Joe Jackson who was someone I, I really admired and uh, and I realized, you know, being an, a great artist or singer, I mean, a great, great artist and writer doesn't necessarily make you a great producer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't kind of gel. And, and plus, you know, I, th I think I was still kind of scarred from my last <laughs> experience. So then, after that, I thought, you know, I'm just gonna work with my, I'm gonna work with friends. Yeah, and and so the demos I did with my my friends became my first album with Atlantic. How did how did you cope at first being dropped from MCA? Did it uh, damage your confidence in, in your own abilities at all? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, it was like what was great about it was you know going for the first time in my life not having to have a, a, a stupid day job that I'm told first of all I'm inept at anything else you know so any other job I would do whether it was waiting tables or selling shoes or whatever day job I was totally awful and inept and it was horrible so what the, just in a practical way it was like having a record and touring for it and not having to have a day gig was like yeah this is the life this is good <laughs> and and plus it was like this is my new life this is my career and and um and then being dropped was uh you know it was even worse back to it's like i tasted something tasted the good life for mm. a bit and yeah, it's gone. Uh, and it was gone. And it, yeah, it was a, it was a really, it was a really hard time. I remember I was living, I moved to LA and uh, they always say being poor and being in New York is really bad, but being poor in Los Angeles is really bad. <laughs> Did it ever drive you to actually consider giving music away? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I felt like, oh, I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing that I have absolutely no marketable skills to do anything else. You know, so it kept me plugging away. But I, I wonder if I would have had, you know, some sort of skill to do something else, I might have done it. Yeah. <laughs> now, as you said, you went on to Atlantic Records and um, found yourself out of the blue with a, with a hit single. When you wrote I Kissed a Girl, did you envisage it as a potential hit single? No, I never even thought it would probably be on any record because I always write kind of oddball songs, you know, every day that I'll do live, but not necessarily uh, you know, record. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we did a little demo of it, which is the 
version that's that is the final version on the record and and i remember playing it for a and the a and r guy and he was like we've got to have this on the record so i was like oh okay <laughs> <laughs> sure <laughs> i've got no shame it's great so its success surprised you Oh, completely, because even on the MCA record, I didn't have really any success. It was just great to have a record and tour, get some tour support and, and play, uh, you know, places I've never been. And so this was, I remember the first time seeing it on uh, MTV, and it was just so, oh, yeah, it completely took me. First of all, I always considered myself, if I was going to sustain a career, it was going to be more in kind of a cult, cultish uh, you know, more underground kind of, you know, hipper singer song. I know <laughs> I never thought I'd be on MTV. Yeah. Uh, or it would be on, you know, top 10 radio. Uh, so that, that totally took me by surprise. So I guess by this time, having a bit of experience in the, in the music industry, you would have been a little bit better prepared when the commercial success didn't continue after that point. No. No. <laughs> no, because it was a whole different level. Yeah. It was a whole different level. And I think, uh, I mean, now, I mean, it took me a few months to really, um, you, you know, there's always been that, I think, pull with me of of wanting to have, you know, that success and commercial success. And the other hand, wanting to just be an artist and having this, like, you know. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want to do, you know, and, and, and be tr very true and do be as weird as I want to be. But, um, so I think there was that pull there. And once I, you know, you have, you have that kind of success. It's, 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 it's nice to have that, uh, exposure and acceptance, <laughs> you know? So, uh, yeah, that was, that was kind of, a uh, a drag, but on the other hand, um, you know that uh, I don't think I would have written this if I hadn't had if I would have had maybe continued success with Supermodel and Kissed a Girl uh, I don't think I would have written Happy Town I don't think I would have written Pink Pearl I, you know yeah you know it, it, there's one hand where you can say you know oh, you know what a drag but on the other hand maybe I'm a better artist now because of that yeah yep. yeah yeah so, and now, you know, now to it, now, now, again, I'm at a place where I'm doing records right now when I'm, I'm working on my next record where I, I don't think about, is, you know, writing a song thinking, is this going to be on radio? Or, or to try to uh, write a song that will be on radio. My whole attitude, and, and even with Pink Pearl, is, is I'm just going to write what I write, and, and what, it would be great if it was successful. So it was harder, harder to accept second time around being being dropped by Atlantic uh, as it was from from MCA because at least you'd given them you know, some commercial return. Yeah, you, you know. Also, I th I think um, I didn't take it. You know, I had a lot of I, I was playing a lot and touring, and I didn't have it. Didn't kill me as much, maybe you know, with my esteem or ego, because when I got dropped from, you know, MCA, I thought, like, I'm horrible, I'm terrible, and, mm -hmm. and looking at them as, as a true judge of worth and, and, and uh, music. And and when I got dropped from M uh, Atlantic, it was like, those assholes, they don't know what's good, you know. <laughs> Maybe it's defensive, but it's a better attitude overall, you know. <laughs> And uh, so, but, you know, still it was, it was hard, but I felt like I, I would continue to have a career mm -hmm. and, and through that developed enough of a, of a fan base where I could have a career. I wasn't worried. You know, there's always that worry. I always have that fear someday I'm going to be, you know, the bag lady on the street, you know, <laughs> but I didn't have that fear. Uh, I, I, that I would continue to do what I'm doing. Was it around this time that you um, did some touring with Lloyd Cole? Oh, yeah. yeah. And that was another thing that was great. It was almost back to my roots of just being a guitar player. When um, when I met Lloyd, and I met him at this kind of songwriter's retreat in Ireland, and 
we were all jamming for a week and playing and writing. A bunch of people in, in Lloyd liked my guitar playing and asked me when we were there if I wanted to be in his band. He was starting the negatives. And, and you know how people say, like, let's have lunch, but you never do. Mm -hmm. You know, I thought like, okay, yeah, sure, I'll be in your band. <laughs> and then when we got home a week later, he said, oh, well, you know, we've got rehearsals in a couple weeks. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> okay. And and so after I got off the phone, I, I had not practiced, like really practiced guitar since like high school, you know? <laughs> I was like on my guitar. And it was great. It, it, there was something so great about, um, well, one thing I was gonna say is that after you get dropped, sometimes you get this sense of like, it kind of pollutes your sense of, of your love of music. Mm. I mean, the music was everything to me growing up and, and, and saved me from so, you know, those bad adolescent years. And and um, and I started, like, not wanting to go out to see music, not wanting to hear new stuff, not wanting to do anything but listen to music because it just maybe reminded me of, of, you know, my failure or bitterness. And with Lloyd, it was great because I, I was a part of a band, and and I was just a support, and I just wanted to be a better guitar player. And um, so that was a really important thing for me to do. Now you say you, uh, met, you met Lloyd at a, at a songwriter's retreat. Have you done any of those? Uh, well, uh, just uh, just a couple of them I did. Uh, there's these people that put together, for instance, this one guy who who's, uh, you know, Miles Copeland? Yep. He has a castle in France, and he gets writers together, and his his writers he's got a publishing company and you know puts them together to write and it's a really it's a really great thing you you meet you know artists never get together mm. you know to write it's it's uh i mean when i was in france i did a, a thing with a song with e from the eels and he actually put it on his record and and uh you know you're meeting peers and people you really respect so so meeting lloyd was was really fortunate for sure with the, the, the record company roller coaster ride you've been on over the years, have you ever been tempted to go totally independent and, and just start up oh, your own label? Absolutely. Well, that's what we're working my uh, beyond the Pink Pearl record. There's no uh, beyond, I don't believe, anymore. So I'm I'm thinking, debating on, and there's been mistakes. Like, uh, you know, why wasn't Pink Pearl in Australia? Mm -hmm. You know, um, so... I'm definitely right now, as we're speaking, debating and, and looking at my options for uh, going, you know. I mean, the, the thing is, going out on your own is, is um, you, you actually control things and you can actually, uh, you know, I, I, I've never made a penny on any records and I even had a hit. Yeah. The way the record companies are. Not that that's the old, most important, but... You know, I thought, well, gosh, you know, maybe I should be doing more things myself. And what, what an education. So right now, as I'm speaking to you, this is what I'm debating. <laughs> we wouldn't have to sell as, as many records to, to make probably more money. Yeah. I mean, you know, the thing is, is what's most important to me is to sell rec to get, you know, to turn as many people on as possible to you. Yeah. You know, wh whether, you know, that that's the thing is, is if you go with a major, maybe not. You know, you, you, you could possibly have more exposure, which ultimately, you know, I, I would love. But, um, you know, doing it on your own, you could actually kind of make a living and, and uh, you know, have more control. I think your, your past labels have had trouble knowing just how to correctly market your music, not knowing quite where you fit in? Oh, my God. Well, they they had no idea. Well, it's funny. The guy from Atlantic Records who signed me, uh, Jason, who who was uh, Lava. Actually, I'm his, the only Lava artist that didn't make it big. He had, uh, who did they have? Matchbox 20, Kid Rock, Sugar Ray. I'm the only one, you know. And and he, he came out in an article on Billboard saying, you know, he felt, that they made it he felt his biggest regret was they they made some mistakes with me on on marketing well you know it was first of all having kissed a girl you know and and all of a sudden that was my first single and you know people didn't want to know about uh i'd go to interviews or i'd have uh, radio shows and people not ask about the music or the songs they'd say so uh 
So tell me about Kiss the Girl. Who was it? What are you? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, my God. It was like, oh, I, you know, I understand I put out that song, but I wasn't ready for for what was going to follow. Mm. <laughs> So, so I think that it was like they didn't know, what, you know, was, was this an, a novelty song? What, was I holding the lesbian or bisexual banner high? Um, you know, and, and it got really confused rather than the music. Yeah. Your uh, your humor and wit is, is often apparent in your songwriting. Uh, do you think a, a person can survive in the music industry without a sense of humor? Maybe not necessarily in their music, but you have to have it. You have to have a kind of whatever. I mean, that's the great thing now. I wish I knew what I knew. I, I wish I knew back then what I knew now. You know, now uh, I'm not going to be bitter about the music industry because I know what it is mm -hmm. now. You know, and and it's not going to hurt me anymore. It's, uh, but I, I think you have to have a thick skin. And, and and you do have to have a big sense of a macabre sense of humor to <laughs> do what we do. Just on to your songwriting, do you constantly uh, keep your eyes and ears open for for song subject matter, or or do they those ideas just just come to you naturally? No, I'm not one of those that I hate those people that say they write every day. That really bugs me, you know, because I don't have that discipline. But mm. the one thing I do do is, you know, jot things down. I always have a little spiral book with me, and I'm a huge noticer, a big voyeur. Um, for instance, uh, I've been doing, uh, I've been playing so much, I've been doing colleges all over the country and playing places I've never been. For instance, the other week I was in the Deep South in Virginia, where, where they actually banned Kissed a Girl on the radio, <laughs> which I always thought was really cool, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, so being in places with different people and, and you know, I'm just, uh, when I come home from the show, I'm always writing down things. So then later, you know, I, I, as far as after next week, I'm really done with my shows for this year and I'm going to just look over everything and that's when I start writing. Okay. Is there a certain frame of mind you have to be in to, to, to write effectively? Oh, yeah, I have to have nothing else going on. I'm I'm really bad. I wish I could be one of those that writes on the road, but I can't. It's like a different frame of mind, and I have to really put aside everything because I am, you know, uh, ADD. I mean, not, I'm not clinically, but who who knows if anyone is, but I, I have to be in a place where, oh, there's no TV, there's no phone, there's no books, or, you know, or else I'll be like, oh, I'm writing, ah, hey, what's on the news, you know? <laughs> I get easily distracted, whereas for me, writing, I have to be in a place where I have to sit and suffer through it, at least for the first two days, and then things start flowing. Now, you recently put out a, a compilation album of, of your past work. Was there any criteria that, that you used in, in the song selection there? No. I, and, you know, I always, every day, I think of, like, uh, a different song selection I could have done you know it was just kind of random of that day when the record company said we have to have it now mm. so you know still I look at it and go oh I should have put this song on or, oh yeah. I should have taken that one out and taken that so you know now on top of your own albums you've also found your way onto uh, a few movie soundtracks and uh, other compilation albums do you seek these out or that you just just had them come to you uh did, say that again? Do they come to me, or do you actively seek out this type of work, or is it you just been lucky that just uh, just fell in your lap, sort of thing? Uh, these ones have been kind of lucky that uh, they've come to me, um, uh, uh, except for, yeah, actually they have. They've they've all kind of come for me. They, so they haven't been songs uh, that they've they've been my own songs. So it hasn't been an assignment where someone says, write this. Right. So it hasn't been commissioned for the film or anything like that. Right. Yeah. Although, actually, I've been getting this recently, getting things to write for, actually, for uh, for movies. For uh, I've been getting it recently, which is kind of fun for me to have an assignment. The different process in the songwriting method that you go through there to do that? Well, it kind of makes it easier in one way because it's... it's uh, for instance, uh, this movie where they need some, uh, you know, the, the one woman plays this kind of a singer-songwriter type, and, uh, 
you know, I'm looking at the script and going, oh, well, this is a song where she's just been dumped and, and you know, blah, blah, blah. It, it gives me a focal point to write from. When sometimes if it's like, okay, I'm going to sit down and write a song, you know, <laughs> you know, if they, you know, it'd be like, uh, uh, the big blank page, I'd feel like uh, Jack Nicholson in The Shining, you know. <laughs> Whereas at least it gives it a focus, but it's still your song, you know. Yeah. Because cause you have to, you know, even though I'm looking at the, the script, I'm thinking about, oh, when I, what about when I was dumped, you know. <laughs> Now, your website's quite an impressive piece of work. I, I believe you take uh, an, a very active part in it. Oh, yeah, and it's just beginning. I'm ta- Yesterday I talked with um, a, a web designer, and we're, we're, going, we're going full force. We're going to have some really interesting things. I read that um, at one stage your fans came to your rescue after you had a bit of a mishap with your laptop. That was so sweet. Because <laughs> what I would do is there's a... a, a a news group uh, uh, that uh, they they kind of called Happy Town, and they kind of talk uh, about subjects. Uh, you know, they go off topic, but you know, it's based around me. But you know, they they have all become friends, and and uh, and I write, and I wrote them saying how um, you know I was really uh, sorry I can't talk to you guys. I'm going on tour, and and I don't have you know. It was during the poor days. You know? <laughs> not that they're still not there, but at least I have a, a, a laptop in, and I, I I won't be able to talk to you guys for a while till I'm back and I can get on a friend's computer because I stepped on my computer. So all these people like put in ten dollars or something and, and chipped in and bought me uh, an iBook. Uh huh. Lovely. It was so awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so on on Pink Pearl, there's a, I think a a list of things, you know, there's a section for all the iBook people. Now, just before we wind up, Jill, is, are there any um, plans for a new studio album on the way? Oh, absolutely. I, in fact, uh, I've got about 35 four- songs. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm going to go back and finish s- some of those at the end of November and then decide. It's, it's almost like I've got two different albums out. I, I don't I, I might put two different albums out one is really folky like like really acoustic and I might and then one is more produced and more kind of rocky so I might put out two records like one would be the folk years 2002 2003 or something <laughs> you know? something that where it's really acoustic and sort of what you would see live when it's just me and then the other one's more produced and so that that's my latest idea oh there's another reason to go independent you'll have the freedom to do that Put out two albums at once. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? And the other thing is on my webpage, I'm going to, uh, I'm actually going uh, to Pittsburgh this weekend. I did a, a, a show a couple months ago there, two shows there, where they have this great audio and, and visual facilities there. So they were filming it and, and taping it. And I'm going to go and edit it uh, this weekend and put out a DVD on my website. Oh, excellent. Yeah, for people to buy, like 10 bucks. Fantastic. So that that's my first thing into independence. So it'll be fun. <laughs> that's terrific, Jill. Look, thanks for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to finally catch up with you and uh, have a chat. Hey, thank you so much, and I can't wait to get uh, down there. I get so much mail from people saying, "When are you going to come down?" And and uh, I really am looking forward to it because I love it so much. Oh, great! We'd love to see you down here. And uh, all right. Hopefully, there, would there be any moves afoot to get Pink Pearl released down here? Local you know distribution? What? Yeah, we're trying to work on it right now as we're talking. Tremendous. All right. Fantastic, Jill. Thanks again. Thank you. And uh, all the best with the uh, with the new two albums. All right. <laughs> great to get them out there. I don't think there's any danger we'll ever see you as a bag lady on the street. Thank <laughs> you. But if, if, if I am, will you buy my tin cans? I promise I will. Okay, thanks. Okay, take care, Jill. Bye. Ta-da.